Lennon was born at Liverpool Maternity Hospital to Julia and Alfred Lennon in 1940. Alfred was a merchant seaman of Irish descent who was away at the time of his son's birth. His parents named him John Winston Lennon after his paternal grandfather, John Jack Lennon, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill. His father was often away from home, but sent regular paychecks to 9 Newcastle Road, Livy Arpiel, where Lennon lived with his mother, the checks stopped when he went absent without leave in February 1944. When he eventually came home six months later, he offered to look after the family, but Julia, by then pregnant with another man's child, rejected the idea. After her sister Mimi complained to Livy Arpiel's social services twice, Julia gave her custody of Lennon. Throughout the rest of his childhood and adolescence, Lennon lived at Mendips, 251 Menlove Avenue, Walton, with Mimi and her husband George Tugood Smith, who had no children of their own. His aunt purchased volumes of short stories for him, and his uncle, a dairyman at his family's farm, bought him a mouth organ and engaged him in solving crossword puzzles. Julia visited Mendips on a regular basis, and John often visited her at 1 Blomfield Road, Livy Arpiel, where she played him Elvis Presley records, taught him the banjo, and showed him how to play Ain't That a Shame by Fats Domino. In September 1980, Lennon commented about his family and his rebellious nature. A part of me would like to be accepted by all facets of society, and not be this loudmouth lunatic poet, musician. But I cannot be what I am not. I was the one who all the other boys' parents, including Paul's father, would say, keep away from him. The parents instinctively recognized I was a troublemaker, meaning I did not conform, and I would influence their children, which I did. I did my best to disrupt every friend's home. Partly out of envy that I didn't have this so-called home. But I did. There were five women that were my family. Five strong, intelligent, beautiful women, five sisters. One happened to be my mother. She just couldn't deal with life. She was the youngest and she had a husband who ran away to sea and the war was on and she couldn't cope with me, and I ended up living with her elder sister. Now those women were fantastic. And that was my first feminist education. I would infiltrate the other boys' minds. I could say, parents are not gods because I don't live with mine and, therefore, I know. At the age of 15, Lennon formed a skiffle group, the Quarrymen. Named after Quarry Bank High School, the group was established by Lennon in September 1956. By the summer of 1957, the Quarrymen played a spirited set of songs made up of half skiffle and half rock and roll. Lennon first met Paul McCartney at the Quarrymen's second performance, which was held in Walton on 6 July at the St. Peter's Church Garden Fete. Lennon then asked McCartney to join the band. McCartney said that Aunt Mimi was very aware that John's friends were lower class and would often patronize him when he arrived to visit Lennon. According to McCartney's brother Mike, their father similarly disapproved of Lennon, declaring that Lennon would get his son into trouble. McCartney's father nevertheless allowed the fledgling band to rehearse in the family's front room at 24th Lynn Road. During this time Lennon wrote his first song, Hello Little Girl, which became a UK top 10 hit for the foremost in 1963. McCartney recommended that his friend George Harrison become the lead guitarist. Lennon thought that Harrison, then 14 years old, was too young. McCartney engineered an audition on the upper deck of a Livy RPL bus, where Harrison played raunchy for Lennon and was asked to join. Stuart Sutcliffe, Lennon's friend from art school, later joined as bassist. Lennon, McCartney, Harrison and Sutcliffe became the Beatles in early 1960. In August that year, the Beatles were engaged for a 48-night residency in Hamburg, in West Germany, and were desperately in need of a drummer. They asked Pete Best to join them. Lennon's aunt, horrified when he told her about the trip, pleaded with Lennon to continue his art studies instead. After the first Hamburg residency, the band accepted another in April 1961, and a third in April 1962. As with the other band members, Lennon was introduced to Preludin while in Hamburg and regularly took the drug as a stimulant during their long, overnight performances. After the band's final concert on August 29, 1966, Lennon filmed the anti-war black comedy How I Won the War, his only appearance in a non-Beatles feature film, before rejoining his bandmates for an extended period of recording, beginning in November. 
Lennon had increased his use of LSD and, according to author Ian MacDonald, his continuous use of the drug in 1967 brought him close to erasing his identity. The year 1967 saw the release of Strawberry Fields Forever, hailed by Time magazine for its astonishing inventiveness, and the group's landmark album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which revealed lyrics by Lennon that contrasted strongly with the simple love songs of the group's early years. Lennon left the Beatles in September 1969, but agreed not to inform the media while the group renegotiated their recording contract. He was outraged that McCartney publicized his own departure on releasing his debut solo album in April 1970. Lennon's reaction was, Jesus Christ. He gets all the credit for it. He later wrote, I started the band. I disbanded it. It's as simple as that. In a December 1970 interview with Jan Wenner of Rolling Stone magazine, he revealed his bitterness towards McCartney, saying, I was a fool not to do what Paul did, which was use it to sell a record. Lennon also spoke of the hostility he perceived the other members had towards Ono, and of how he, Harrison, and Starr got fed up with being sidemen for Paul. After Brian Epstein died we collapsed. Paul took over and supposedly led us. But what is leading us when we went round in circles? At approximately 5 p.m. on December 8, 1980, Lennon autographed a copy of Double Fantasy for fan Mark David Chapman before leaving the Dakota with Ono for a recording session at the record plant. After the session, Lennon and Ono returned to their Manhattan apartment in a limousine at around 10.50 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They exited the vehicle and walked through the archway of the building when Chapman shot Lennon twice in the back and twice in the shoulder at close range. Lennon was rushed in a police cruiser to the emergency room of Roosevelt Hospital, where he was pronounced dead on arrival at 11.15 p.m. Ono issued a statement the next day, saying there is no funeral for John, ending it with the words, John loved and prayed for the human race. Please do the same for him. His remains were cremated at Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. Ono scattered his ashes in New York's Central Park, where the Strawberry Fields Memorial was later created. Chapman avoided going to trial when he ignored his lawyer's advice and pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 20 years to life. In the weeks following the murder, just like, starting over and double fantasy topped the charts in the UK and the US. In a further example of the public outpouring of grief, Imagine hit number one in the UK in January 1981 and Happy Christmas peaked at number two. Imagine was succeeded at the top of the UK chart by Woman, the second single from Double Fantasy. Later that year, Roxy Music's cover version of Jealous Guy, recorded as a tribute to Lennon, was also a UK number one. Lennon played a mouth organ during a bus journey to visit his cousin in Scotland. The music caught the driver's ear. Impressed, the driver told Lennon of a harmonica he could have if he came to Edinburgh the following day, where one had been stored in the bus depot since a passenger had left it on a bus. The professional instrument quickly replaced Lennon's toy. He would continue to play the harmonica, often using the instrument during the Beatles' Hamburg years, and it became a signature sound in the group's early recordings. His mother taught him how to play the banjo, later buying him an acoustic guitar. At 16, he played rhythm guitar with the Quarrymen. As his career progressed, he played a variety of electric guitars, predominantly the Rickenbacker 325, Epiphone Casino and Gibson J160E and, from the start of his solo career, the Gibson Les Paul Jr. Double Fantasy producer Jack Douglas claimed that since his Beatle days Lennon habitually tuned his D-string slightly flat, so his Aunt Mimi could tell which guitar was his on recordings. Occasionally he played a six-string bass guitar, the Fender Bass 6, providing bass on some Beatles numbers back in the USSR, the long and winding road, Helter Skelter, that occupied McCartney with another instrument. His other instrument of choice was the piano, on which he composed many songs, including Imagine, described as his best-known solo work. His jamming on a piano with McCartney in 1963 led to the creation of the Beatles' first US number one, I Want to Hold Your Hand. In 1964, he became one of the first British musicians to acquire a Mellotron keyboard, though it was not heard on a Beatles recording until Strawberry Fields Forever in 1967. The British critic Nick Cohn observed of Lennon, he owned one of the best pop voices ever, rasped and smashed and brooding, always fierce. 
Cohn wrote that Lennon, performing Twist and Shout, would rant his way into total incoherence, half rupture himself. When the Beatles recorded the song, the final track during the Mammoth One Day session that produced the band's 1963 debut album, Please Please Me, Lennon's voice, already compromised by a cold, came close to giving out. Lennon said, I couldn't sing the damn thing, I was just screaming. In the words of biographer Barry Miles, Lennon simply shredded his vocal cords in the interests of rock and roll. The Beatles producer, George Martin, tells how Lennon had an inborn dislike of his own voice which I could never understand. He was always saying to me, do something with my voice. Put something on it. Make it different. Martin obliged, often using double tracking and other techniques. As his Beatles era segued into his solo career, his singing voice found a widening range of expression. Biographer Chris Gregory writes of Lennon tentatively beginning to expose his insecurities in a number of acoustic-led confessional ballads, so beginning the process of public therapy that will eventually culminate in the primal screams of Cold Turkey and the cathartic John Lennon slash Plastic Ono band. Music critic Robert Christgau called this Lennon's greatest vocal performance. From scream to wine is modulated electronically. Echoed, filtered, and double-tracked. David Stewart Ryan described Lennon's vocal delivery as ranging from extreme vulnerability, sensitivity, and even naivety to a hard rasping style. Wiener too described contrasts, saying the singer's voice can be at first subdued, soon it almost cracks with despair. Music historian Ben Urish recalled hearing the Beatles' Ed Sullivan show performance of This Boy played on the radio a few days after Lennon's murder, as Lennon's vocals reached their peak. It hurt too much to hear him scream with such anguish and emotion. But it was my emotions I heard in his voice. Just like I always had.